Hey, I'm Curtis, and these 200-year-old books have totally changed my life, and I think they can change yours, too. There's a movie out on Netflix right now called Things Heard and Seen, starring Amanda Seyfried. Well, did you know? Large parts of that movie, including the title, came out of the spiritual experiences of Emanuel Swedenborg. In this video, we're going to tell you just what parts of Things Heard and Seen came out of Swedenborg's book, Heaven and Hell. We'll explain the title, the first quote in the movie, our connection to kindred spirits from the middle, and the mention of the world of spirits from the end of the movie. But first, who is this Emanuel Swedenborg anyway? If you want to hear a lot about his life and experiences, we've got a great podcast for you to check out called Inside Off the Left Eye. But right now, here's the essentials. Emanuel Swedenborg was born in 1688 in Sweden. Yes, it's in his name, which was Swedbury, until his family was ennobled by the Queen of Sweden and given the name Swedenborg. He died in England in 1772. He was a scientist and worked as an assessor on the Swedish Board of Mines. He published the first scientific journal in Sweden, the Daedalus Hyperboreus. Don't get the wrong idea, it wasn't hyperboring. In fact, it was the precursor to and the initial basis for the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Ever heard of the Nobel Prize? Yeah, that's them. Swedenborg was at the forefront of all the sciences of his day, especially anatomy and brain science before neuroscience was a field of study. By his 50s, he was on a personal mission to find the seat of the soul in the human body while writing his masterwork, The Soul's Domain, when he began to have spiritual experiences. They started as intense dreams. His dream journal is one of the oldest and longest series of dreams and their analysis known to exist. You should check it out. But then they gradually developed into him having open communication with spirits and angels. Eventually, his communication with the spiritual world became continuous, to the point that he could be in both worlds at once and could travel and experience things in the spiritual world while also continuing his life and work in this world. This dual consciousness continued for the rest of his life, and in that time, he published 18 theological works about the levels of meaning in the Bible, life after death, and the dawn of a new spiritual era. Who did this? Who did this? So that's your Swedenborg download. Now let's see how the movie Things Heard and Seen drew from what Swedenborg learned through his spiritual experiences. You don't have to go far to see the influence of Swedenborg's heaven and hell on this movie because the name, Things Heard and Seen, that's right out of Swedenborg, like it shows in the film he had on his title pages, or title page for this, Drawn from Things Heard and Seen. Where would you put that in there? It's There's a lot of reasons, but one thing he's trying to say is, look, this is not just speculative theology. This is not just religious authority. This is empiricism, which was big in his day and still, it still matters. He's saying, this, this is real. This is real. I, I went and, and saw this and felt this and heard this myself. This is not something that matters if you're going to church or something. This is how the world functions. The first thing you see in the movie is this quote, this I can declare that the things uh, in heaven are more real than the things that are in the world. And there's two ways in which Swedenborg describes the spiritual world as more real. There is that it's substantially just as, and in fact, more real than what we have here, but also that it's at the core of what matters. It's like real. So starting out with that first one, he says, if people have no concept, this is in 264, of heaven, and do not want any concept of it other than of some insubstantial atmosphere in which angels fly around like intellectual minds without the sense of hearing and sight. They cannot believe that ang angels have language and writing. Yeah, he uses this idea of, or this instance of angels actually getting down and I guess doing sort of what we're doing here, writing in that world. And that is to illustrate that it's just as concrete and material as here. You may not feel like you have some concept like this, although a lot of scholars had it in Swedenborg's day, but I think we can see an analog in thinking, oh yeah, well, spiritual things, and then there's real things. Even if you think there is the existence of something spiritual, that it's just kind of, oh yeah, and things like you should love people and all that, it's just kind of like it's airy-fairy and it's out there, and then there's the real stuff. He's saying, no, that that stuff is, is more concrete. It's not dreamlike. It's it's reality. This is like more the dream that we're in right now. And one way that's illustrated is that angels even have language and writing. 
They locate the entire presence of everything in matter, they being the people of this mindset here. Yet the things that one finds in heaven occur with just as much reality as those in our world. And the angels who are there have everything they need for life and everything they need for wisdom. You and I can be on a trajectory to become an angel. An angel in Swedenborg's definition is just a person who has gone through the regenerative process and is now in the afterlife connected to heaven. And so you you think about the kind of life that that would entail. It's not this reduction of everything into you're just sitting on a cloud, you're just playing a harp. You continue to learn and grow Yeah, so you can even study and write. The other kind of real is that heaven is at the core of our emotional and psychological experiences here. It is the center of human life. And this is illustrated really well in 479, where he says, All heaven is differentiated into communities. Communities on the basis of differences in the quality of love. And every spirit who is raised up into heaven and becomes an angel is taken to the community where her or his love is. What you care about is like gravity. It's spiritual gravity. And it, what your heart really desires is what pulls you into community with other people who desire the same kind of thing. So what's it like going and meeting up with people who are loving the same thing that you are. When we arrive there, we feel as though we are in our own element, at home, back to our birthplace, so to speak. It's not this, wow, I was, who am I? I'm really this person that was born in this part of the world and that's that now I'm in this adventure and this spiritual realm. Okay, I'll try to find a home here. This is us realizing, oh, this is where I belong. This is actually the realest place because this is where, this is where I actually originate. This, this is me. Angels sense this and associate there with kindred spirits. So you get to hang out with your, your spiritual homies. Okay, jumping into the middle of the movie, there is a line read out of heaven and hell. All of us on earth are associated with those in the spiritual world who are like ourselves. We are, in a sense, united to them. And you see this rendered really dramatically in the movie. They are doing a seance around a table. There's candles and the tablecloth in the middle flies up around the room and it's freaky. I don't know if stuff like that can happen in real life, but Swedenborg does describe this intimate connection with the spiritual world that I think is actually even more bizarre than cloth flying around. This is in number 292 of Heaven and Hell. He says, there are good spirits and evil spirits with every individual. So not just movie stars. All of us have good and evil spirits, good and evil spirits around us. We have our union with heaven through the good ones good spirits, yeah, and our union with hell through the evil ones. Oh, thanks, but no thanks. So why do we have both of those? These spirits, how does this work mechanically? These spirits are in the world of spirits. More about that a little bit later in this video, which is intermediate between heaven and hell and will be specifically treated later in the book as well. When these spirits come to us, our good and evil spirits, the angel and the devil on the shoulder, when these spirits come to us, told you this is going to get weird. They come into our whole, they come into our whole memory and from there into all of our thinking. So they can access all of our memories and how we think. Evil spirits into the matters of memory and thought that are evil and good spirits into the matters of memory and thought that are good. So you've got us, right? That's a representation of how our head looks. And in us, there are these positive things, you know, everything good and you, that you're proud of that you've done. And then there's ev- a done, but also thought, everything you're holding on to. It's more than just memory bank. But then there's also, we'll give it this one here, all, everything negative that we're holding on to and love. And when these spirits show up, the angels gravitate toward and almost dwell in, the good spirits dwell in what's positive and the negative spirits dwell in what's negative in us and almost like mind meld to an extent. These spirits are totally unaware that they are with us. Rather, as long as they are, they, I, I told you, they believe that all these matters of our memory and thought are actually theirs. They do not see us either 
because their sight does not extend to things in our subsolar world. So it might seem like in this paragraph, he's just trying to describe as bizarre an arrangement as you can possibly do, and he's trying to score 100 out of 100 on that. But there's a reason, which he gives. I'll skip down just a little bit. Things can be weird as long as there's a there's an underpinning mechanism that that necessitates them being like that. Through the two kinds, evil and good spirits, we are kept in a balance. And since we are in a balance, we enjoy an appropriate measure of that essential nutrient for consciousness, freedom, and can be led out of evils and turned toward good. This good can be sown in us as well, which could never happen except in our freedom. Unless we're able to have a theater in front of us where we can say, oh, I get and understand what evil and good are, and I get what harming people is and what being nice to them is, and I can look at that in this choose-your-own-adventure and come to value what's good and reject what's evil, that's the only way that we can actually let God in. This good can be sown in us as well, which could never happen except in our freedom. And the freedom could not be granted us unless spirits from hell were acting on the one side and spirits from heaven on the other with us in the middle. So we're suspended between these two centers of gravity so that we can move however we choose. And then at the end of the movie, there's a big dramatic ending. Guy is sailing into this fiery sky. A lot of people are wondering, what? What's going on there? And if you listen, there are these quotes from Swedenborg being read. And one of them says, the world of spirits is not heaven or hell, but a place in between the two. We go to heaven and hell 425. It says, so in order that we may gain either heaven or hell, after death, we are first taken to the world of spirits. What's going on in the world of spirits? Why do we want to be there? Where either the union of the good and the true takes place for people who are to be raised into heaven, or the union of the evil and the false for people who are to be cast into hell. Why? This is because no one in heaven or in hell is allowed to have a divided mind to understand one thing and intend something else. And this is actually the crux of the movie because you have this bad guy. Of course there's spoilers in this. If don't, don't, don't listen, turn it off. You have the, the main bad guy is this guy who acts like he's real good and learned and friendly and charismatic, but actually he goes around and kills people and he goes around and, and undermines things and lies and does everything bad but acts like he's good. And in heaven, right, in the world, you have that, that frustrating and dangerous occurrence, but in heaven and hell, it's, you've got to pick a lane. Pick a lane. If you love to do what's evil, you can't have the appearance of truth. You can't seem like you're an upstanding person. You just got to look like you love what's evil. But when, on the flip side, if we choose to love what's good, we love, uh, you know, being kind to people and letting them live their lives and not trying to take their resources for ourselves, then you get freed from all the falsity, all the untrue things that kind of confuse us and drag us down, and you get pulled up into this state of heaven. So in the end there, you see the movie as it's as it's coming to its conclusion, you've got this guy uniting what's evil and false inside himself. He's, he's got all these delusions and he's now taken these horrific actions to go kill a bunch of people. And he's telling himself, well, well it's their fault. Like he's, he's completing his choice to live for the pleasures of hell, the pleasures of selfishness. And so you see him sailing out on that sea. Really, it's this metaphor, this correspondence for that journey of, okay, you're joining those together. It doesn't matter if you're in the afterlife or not. Joining those things together, evil and falsity, that is hell, and it causes hell for yourself and everyone else. And joining what's good and true on the flip side, it brings heaven. So what we can do is take concepts that we learn in all kinds of spiritually themed places and use those tr that truth to unite to doing good things. If, if 
Spiritual ideas inspire us to go out and be kind to people and do things that make the world a better place, then that is what heaven is. And that is how you can be in heaven right now. Whether or not you're hearing and seeing supernatural things, you can be participating in heaven today. 